So this stage of the project started off quite early, um, almost after, immediately after we finished uh, completion of the previous project. And the real question was, could we use these controllers that we've designed to con essentially control a camera, out, regardless of uh, it being inside of Unreal Engine or something like that, right? So the main objective was to make sure that we could use some of these controllers, not every single one of them, to play and pause, to adjust things to do with zoom, to adjust things to do with the aperture, and um, that's uh, maybe, and focus as well, that was the, the primary one. So we had four main functions on the camera to control. Um, as such, we, we didn't really need to adjust uh, some of the more uh, finite controls because all these controls are things that needed to be synced up inside of Unreal Engine. The exposure impacts the light inside of engine and inside of the camera. The focus obviously impacts the focus. The zoom impacts the zoom and the, and the, the crop factor inside of inside of the, the uh, Unreal Engine. And obviously recording, start and stop recording um, could be useful to do synchronization after the fact in post-production. So there's a few functions that we wanted to really test to make sure that we could use this. And it all came down to start off with the um, the black magic arduino shield and it's this is it here it's sitting on top of my arduino uno and um the arduino uno isn't the board that we used for the final thing but we did a lot of prototyping on that so inside of the the housing uh we used this little nano and that nano was quite good for the form factor that we're going for however the bread the kind of breadboard attached to the arduino uno is very primary to what we do and the shield fits directly on top of that with all the pins and it works quite well. And this was specifically used or, or developed by Blackmagic to work with the SDK applied for, um, available for the cameras. All right. um, why did we choose Blackmagic? Well, there's a lot of kind of indie production levels out there on, on YouTube that do a good job of using the Blackmagic camera and uh, it's cheap, it's accessible and it's got a lot of functions and it works quite well as a cinema camera, right? So uh, the fact that there's an SDK available that other people uh, use it for virtual production on an indie scale and uh, there's an Arduino shield that allows for controller um, commands to be sent to the camera, it seemed like a perfect solution and a place to start. Um, adding to that, we did have some Blackmagic available at Staffordshire University. Uh, so accessibility of the cameras was obviously available. All right, so um, you'll see right now some videos that are being shown of the early tests of the Blackmagic camera. We provided, uh, that was provided us an opportunity to plug in an SDI, SDK, uh, STI cable, sorry, we'll get there, uh, to control things to do with aperture and focus as well. And that was pretty successful. It was pretty easy to plug them in and uh, get that working. There were some issues to do with the actual use of the shield here and the way that the shields work is obviously there's a whole bunch of pins that connect directly to the Arduino Uno pins but the problem is if we're using this microcontroller right here we need to connect the pins up and synchronize it um, that's not usually a big issue because we can create our own custom PCBs such as this to act as a, a connection between major connections right um, but the form factor of this meant that we could only achieve a 9600 baud rate. That is a little bit of a problem because, um, well, we need a higher rate and um, there are some issues to do with using the shield, right? So, um, including like what type of pins we want to use, the pin in and outs, uh, the microcontrollers need a lot of pins out and in. I think there's a, a total approximate of eight pins and, um, you know, we're limited by that. We did have another board that we could use, which is the larger one, but once again, the speed of this board is much slower than some other boards. So at that point, the, the whole objective of this stage was to prove that we could control the camera via the inputs uh, as a primary thing. Can it be done? Yes, it can. Uh, you saw the video that was showing that we could adjust the aperture, and we could also adjust the focus, and we could start and stop recording. One of the things that I struggled with, and this was a little bit naive on my part, was I thought we would be able to, to control the zoom on the camera. So one of the things was the camera lens that we had access to inside of the test 
room using the um, the studio camera was attached to a micro four thirds lens which had a manual zoom and I wanted an auto zoom or an electric zoom. Um, similar, I suppose, in a way to one of these lenses where they've got the, the rockers on the side to control the lenses and the zoom. So I thought, okay, well, let's see what's available for that. There's none available in the stores. So there was a problem with the lens accessibility for that camera type and the control of the zoom, which I thought at that point in time was a critical issue. So at that point, I thought, okay, well, I need to investigate what lenses are available, what cameras we can use, but the proof was we could control the camera. And uh, at that point, I actually parked this topic and moved on to the light side of things. But just for the, the flow of the, the video, I'm going to continue on with the camera side of things and we'll look at the lights later. So at this point, uh, we've established that there's a light communication with the controller and we could do it via Arduino with a Blackmagic camera. I looked at different Blackmagic cameras available and uh, if there was any available ways to communicate with that camera. And I found one thing called Blue Magic 32. And what that was, it was it was a um, an Ard or a microcontroller library using the Blackmagic SDK that enabled complete control over the camera, which was really cool. But one thing that it did use was a uh, ESP32 chip, which is this one. All right, similar form factor in a way, bit bigger than the previous one. However, the ESP32 provided a lot more uh, in-out pins, um, and it also uh, uh, had Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and the microcontroller systems were much faster. It could run at a faster baud rate, uh, clock speed, and overall, it was a comparable, maybe even cheaper chip with more features and more functionality than the previous one. So at that point, I thought, brilliant, let's try it out and we'll get some of these. So I got uh, quite a number, actually, I bought around six of these microcontrollers. Uh, to say that it was a easy transition from Arduino to the ESP32 would be a lying essentially um, I found it quite difficult the approach for the pin in and out was completely different um, the code was similar no real issue with the code but the functionality and the way that this worked was a uh, completely different kind of approach right um, and plus I think I had some issues to do with the, the way I set it up and the way I developed it right so this was very frustrating. In the early stages, I bought some previous ones that would constantly crash when uploading code. It would constantly um, clear out the memory cache. It would uh, lose the, the bootloader. So I did a lot of problem solving in terms of um, flashing the bootloader, reloading the thing, um, you know, trying to recover broken ones. Uh, it was just not very friendly. But in essence, we got this done and uh, we connected it up to controllers and we managed to get the uh, ESP32 working with a Blackmagic camera via Bluetooth uh, and it worked pretty well, it worked, right? That's the most important thing. The Bluetooth is quite challenging. Um, there was a specific library that needed to be used so it needed to run on 1.0.4 or 1.0.5 um, version of the um, the platform essentially which is not the newest one uh, we needed the specific blue magic 32 um, uh, extension of library and uh, it was very finicky to get that working so luckily enough we managed to get that working after quite a lot of frustration and uh, it works pretty well and you can see that uh, pretty much on the screen right now Let's have a quick look at the code used to control the camera um, and the differences between the previous version that controlled just the virtual camera and the version that now controls both the virtual camera and the physical camera. So uh, we're going to start off with this. We've gone through around three or four different iterations of this and some of it was trial and error, some was to do with uh, trying different libraries 
and also bits of code. Um, it all started off with um, selecting the ESP board and we've obviously looked up the board manager and installed the correct board because the previous one was using the Arduino boards, now we're using the ESP32s. But inside of the board manager, if we do a search for ESP, the most important thing is we've got the Expressive Systems version 1.0.4 installed. And uh, we've got quite a number of versions in here up to 2.0.2. .2. However, 2.0.2 .2 did not work. So that's the most recent one, did not work uh, using the uh, Blue Magic 32 extension. So it's really important to be either using uh, 1.0.4 or 1.0.5 to get this working correctly. So uh, this currently works 1.0.4. And um, the differences between the two is um, when you tried to sync via Bluetooth uh, Low Energy, so BLE device, it just would not connect with the Blackmagic camera, which was really frustrating. So hopefully in the future, someone, uh, the person who's behind the Bluemagic 32 um, library will update it for the latest version of both the SDK and the um, uh, ESP32. All right, so that's, that's the hope. But with that installed, we've also added the library, Blue Magic 32, you can see this here. And uh, one thing that you'll notice is, if you've had a look at the previous version, all of this is pretty straightforward. We've changed the pins, because the pins needed to be those six pins um, only designated for Bluetooth. Uh, so you'll find that if you have a look at the pin types, that's what they are. Uh, but the rest is pretty much similar. We've got a couple of, we've got an extra float here, and we'll go through that. And um, yeah, so same thing, we read the values from the buttons and the sensors. And then we, um, another couple of bits in here is we start the Bluetooth, uh, Blue Magic 32, this could be named whatever we want. We can call this camera controller, we can call it whatever we want. Uh, the, but the BMD connection has begun and also we've connected. Now we've got this commented out, this clear pairing. This became quite useful if we struggled with um, connecting with the Bluetooth low energy device if we just did a clear pairing and we connect it the first for the first time the camera recognized the controller and then the controller would recognize the camera and if we flashed it again with that commented out as a secondary thing well um, it wouldn't have any issues with the pairing side of things in the process so uh, that's what that does um, another one that we're going to go through is this stuff um, but we could probably get rid of that actually. So we had a few different things going on, which was to do with um, taking in the, uh, the the value of the focus on the camera and um, mapping that essentially to zero to one range. Um, the problem was the type of lens I was using did not work with the function for the um, the focus distance so we had to remap that and there was a, a post on the, the forum for the blue magic 32 that really did help with that so we're going to come back to that a little bit later oh this is the one here this is probably the one that's used for splitting up the strings for the um rgb value we could probably get rid of that actually that's so that's leftover code uh but this flight focus test essentially sets del delta and then uh, does the math of uh, what's the current focus and what's the set focus value. So are we going left or right based around where the, the value is sitting? And should we rack the focus left or right based on that? Um, so it, it is a little bit clunky, but this is to uh, solve one of the issues that we came across uh, about letting the focus do its job. All right, but let's get into the, beat, the meat of the code. All of this is pretty much the same. We're creating that same string that dictates what um, values are changing and we're sending that off to uh, the, the um, UE4 as well but we've got this little bit in here so the camera Bluetooth controls checks to see if the camera is connected via Bluetooth and then obviously if it doesn't well then we jump out of it it'll um, read button state and toggle on and off so is it on or off and it'll swap between the two which will allow us to um, essentially you know, control the recording. Um, the Blackmagic control focus starts at 0.5, so automatically snap to the central point as a start point, and then from there we can use a few different things. So we're, we're mapping the sensors. The The new version of the ESP32, instead of it, the values going up to 1024, it's a, um, I think it's a higher bit, 
So therefore, we get a range of up, up to 496 now. So we remap that to 1000 because that essentially will re be remapped right back down to a range of 0 to 1. Uh, by going to 1000, we get the decimal point. If we don't have the decimal point, we get it cut, cut off. All right. Um, so going to this point, we check to see if there is a change and if there is a change between the old value and the new value then we're going to run it through the focus test function which was the one up here and then that does run some uh, math essentially converting it um, doing what the the sdk does but in manual code pulled it out into this and we convert it to a decimal point or a float value and then we use that float value to adjust the focus length and height uh, l and h in here um, and we basically just run it through the SDK. It's the manual version of running the SDK, but instead of using the focus command, we're using a custom command, uh, which is driven by that, uh, which is pretty good. And then from that, we come back down here. We've also got a couple more mappings here. Uh, we've got one there theoretically for zoom. If we did have a lens that would be zoomed by the camera, we can control the zoom. So that's something that can be explored. Uh, we can use this function also, we'll, we'll put a function in there to drive something like a stepper motor um, or a servo motor to control a lens zoom. And then we've also got aperture control here, which does have some serial kind of printouts which we could clean up. But in essence, we can run through the value between zero and one as a mapping and then use the SDK to change the aperture, which works pretty well. So. The camera control code is actually pretty simple and the integration of it into the code doesn't change any way that we've done it previously. We still use that string, we still press that string and send it off to um, uh, UE4 and that string is also using the same values for the lens control so that the synchronization of the values should happen simultaneously, one at the camera, one at UE4, exactly at the same time, no problem. So that's how that works and um, yeah, it's pretty simple. So let's have a look at how it all looks in, inside of Unreal Engine and um, how it runs. So we've tried to organize this a little bit more, we've got the custom controller, DMX, light tools and materials as well. Um, let's start off with the custom controller and we've got a few things in here. We've completely redesigned this from the ground up. We've got uh, now little uh, blueprints or blueprint, cra blueprint classes that can be moved between projects. We've refactored the whole thing. And um, it is the same thing when we open it up. If we have a look at this, it still does the same splitting of the values and then runs for the sequence. So this is exactly the same as the previous project and, and triggers um, dispatches, event dispatches. The difference here is we've now exposed the port and the, the baud rate, so we can modify that, and we've got its own blueprint. So previously this used to be sitting inside of the level blueprint, that wasn't very handy when we wanted to move between projects. So now with this updated version, we have a completely drag and drop version of the blueprint that we can use in any project. So that's super, super nifty. Um, we've also done the same for the controller. So let's have a look at the controller. Um, this is very similar to what we had before, but there are a few changes in here as well. And we got some stuff that were more test related things. Uh, we've done some more clamping of values. So we've tried to control the range now, instead of it being up to a zero to 1024 in terms of the value from the um, controls and the joysticks, we've now increased that to 4096. And we've tried to clamp the ranges back um, to, to get a little bit more control. One of the previous issues with the uh, controllers is that it would constantly flicker things like zoom or uh, slight movements, X, Y, um, Z kind of movements and rotations and things like that. So we've tried to put limiters. If it's below, in this case, uh, above one or below uh, negative one, then change based on those restrictors. Anything that, that should mitigate the constant slight, subtle flickering of the um, the controllers, the the analog controls that get get red from the Arduino or the ESP32. Uh, some of these still go beyond that value, so there's a little bit of room to tweak. That could be to do with some of the soldering, could be to do with some of the connections, could be to, to do with things like heat. Um, there's other things in there, but in essence, we've got some clampers for the main movements. Um, other big changes that have happened here, uh, this is all pretty much the same. 
we had to change some of the ways that the containers worked and the cameras worked as well. So if we have a look up here, we've got more uh, control over getting uh, cameras and, and assigning them to different actors and, and cameras as well. Uh, same essence here, but it works pretty well. One other big one that we had to play around with was using the scene capture 2D. So um, we've tried to create custom blueprints for the virtual camera. However, let's have a look at that. Um, we did have a um, scene capture 2D, but referencing that was a little bit more difficult. So we've created one inside of the main scene and we've disconnected it and reconnected it to the cameras and then inherited the position, position as well. All right. Uh, some of this needs to be cleaned up. A lot of it is just to do with me kind of experimenting. But in essence, we, we get the scene capture 2D. We um, kind of disconnected earlier, uh, somewhere up here. Might be a different version, but uh, we disconnect it and then reconnect it as a child and then set the actor a location and rotation as well. Um, so that's relatively new, but the, rest, the rest of it is pretty straightforward. We've updated it and we've ported it over to something that is a little bit more um, modular in nature and that we can move it between projects. So that's pretty cool as well. We started developing little control hubs. So there was a long process that happened between this. We would go through, um, come up with custom transparency sheets, do the photo etching, PCB etching, drilling, soldering, etc., etc. And I made uh, in total three of these. And there's a reason why I made three of these. So the first one, um, somewhere on the table, or it might be on the light itself. Um, essentially, we wired up a direct copy of the controls of this, tested on the breadboard and connected it up and it worked perfectly fine being hooked up into this. Uh, the requirement also of fitting this new one meant that I needed to 3D print another housing. Those original housings meant that I need to re-engineer re this, change the dimensions so you find out that the final one is a little bigger, not by much, but a little bit, right? And the holes are a bit different. So um, we hooked it all up and it worked great in engine, right? Things started going problematic when we started connecting to the Bluetooth. So when we connected to the Bluetooth, there were some controls that didn't work, some things that didn't read properly, buttons that didn't work. And uh, this caused a lot of problems when it came to the, the testing side of things. I had some scheduled tests going on, but when I got to the test site and I hooked it all up, it didn't work properly. And that caused a lot of frustration, probably three whole days in total, me trying to problem solve that. In essence, what it boils down to is the ESP32 can only operate off six analog input pins when your uh, Bluetooth is connected or Wi-Fi. Um, so as a result, I had some of the kit pins connected incorrectly on the circuit board and it wouldn't work, wouldn't read some of the values and we're getting some erratic values. So um, luckily I stumbled across a post within a forum in the middle of nowhere on um, obviously online and we found that solution. And after re-engineering that, a lot of changes, we managed to get a controller that sits right in here. I'm not gonna pull it apart, but that sits in there nicely with optimized cables connected up, working perfectly fine with Bluetooth. And uh, we'll probably see some demos of that working right now. Some of the key attributes that we got hooked up was the focus, we got the aperture working, and we got the record button working. One of the things that we did not get working is the zoom because it turns out you need a LANC lens, so a LANC controller lens, which is motorized with a motor attached to it to control the, the, the zoom. These are typically used in broadcast and they're very expensive on their own, right? So the only element that we didn't get working on this is the zoom inside of Unreal Engine, um, syncing up with the zoom in the real camera. This can be achieved with an external uh, stepper motor um, or something like that uh, or even like a, um, a servo motor to, to control a, a focus lens or a zoom lens I should say. Alternatively because the black magic is so high res if you've got the computing power you can do a digital zoom by scaling up a plane 
or um, doing it all in engine with a higher resolution. So it's not a big issue, all right? But the essence is we got the uh, synchronization of the camera and the or the virtual camera and the physical camera working perfectly fine. Um, there are some uh, requirements to match the physical properties of the camera directly with the virtual properties of the camera. So the lens is the same, the uh, aperture is the same, the ISO is the same, all the settings must be the same for it to work effectively, um, which requires some real world measurements as well. So in essence, we managed to get the camera synced up perfectly without any noticeable lag using an ESP32 and a Blackmagic camera. So we got to that point and it works pretty well. We are missing some elements in terms of synchronization, which is time code and gen lock. The reason we're mess missing that with this project is we need um, a uh, capture card that works with Blackmagic cameras. And we also need a time code capture box that will translate from a HDMI to an SDI, which will go into the capture card. Those elements were missing from this project, unfortunately. I have no doubt that that will work. We've seen that work in uh, other indie projects online. It's just a matter of doing it. So um, given that we've got the camera synced up nicely, we've got the position of the camera done by the HTC Vive trackers. You can see some working in the demos. We are good on that front. So that left us to another point of the project, which is light synchronization. So the next part of the project was to start looking at lights and seeing if we can synchronize the physical light with the virtual lights within Unreal Engine 4. Why do we want to do this? Well, one of the things or the benefits of uh, the digital LED screens that we've seen in uh, high-end productions is the light is behind the actor and it's illuminating the background. Now that can be avoided, well, we don't need that technically if we can green screen the background, we can put the background elements in there um, in post-production or even in engine in a real-time stage but one of the problems that we have is that quite often with virtual production screens we have a LED panel at the top and we'll also have a couple of LED panels on the front and the the point of these LED panels on the top and on the front is that um, they emit light onto the actor so if the light coming from uh, this side of uh, the screen emits onto the actor well then, the, the light should look more organic to match with the background plate, right? Because one of the problems with compositing is if your foreground acting, especially on, on green screen, or the foreground uh, lighting does not match the background, well then it looks completely mismatched, out of place, and inaccurate. So, one of the challenges that we uh, face at this point is, can we illuminate the foreground elements or the, the actor to make it fit with our green screen in the background, right? So whatever we're compositing behind it. My approach was to say, okay, well, maybe we'll start off with controlling um, just a, sim a simple lamp. We'll use our microcontroller to turn the lamp on and off, and then as a result, we can illuminate the foreground. Right? So that was my in initial thought. But early on in the production, I stumbled across some LED strips, and they kind of look like this. This is just a a small one that's cut off um, quite often. Here's another longer one. They have uh, a few cables in there and they've got our positive, we've got a negative, but also we've got an addressable one. All right, so these LED strips became crucial to the project and they're really cool. So inside of each LED, we have a red, a green, and a blue property. So a little filament that will emit the light of RGB. And the addressable nature of that meant that this whole strip could have an individual color assigned to it because they have an array of LEDs, essentially. Um, so we could light each of these any color of the spectrum, which and controlled by microcontrollers. So this is kind of a little bit of a game changer. So instead of just having one flat light that we essentially turn on and off, we can now address in any light to any color and specify that. So at this point you think, okay, well, let's see if we can get some of these and we can just make them work, right? Control them. And very early stage tests of the light synchronization concept was just to get the LED strips working. So you'll see a quick video of that happening right now. 
And then the real question from there is, can we illuminate these lights from a light in engine? And I don't have a video of this, but my main objective was to turn all the lights on in the strip to one color of a, uh, a light source. So we will take the light, we'll get the intensity value, we'll get the red, we'll get the green, we'll get the blue, we'll output that to the Arduino as a print string, and then we'll read the Arduino um, and, and assign that to the lights, right? We'll, we'll make the lights, turn that color, turn on, turn off, turn whatever we need to do of the light. And uh, that was quite easy to set up, right? So light controls via an Arduino had been tested before. Um, some of my early tests started looking at things to do with, um, you know, servo controls, light controls, that type of stuff. So that was pretty straightforward. One of the things that I was really struggling with for quite a while was how do I get the light to replicate um, the environment, right? So using actual lights inside of Unreal, perfectly easy to do. What if we had ambient light? What if we were in a cave and we had a cave entrance in front of us? Uh, what if we were um, in a tunnel with sparking, I don't know, lights from electrical, right? How can we make the lights work organically based around the environment that the actor is located in? One of the problems that I can see that happens in virtual production is you'll need to customize or replicate the lighting inside of um, the, the, the environment with physical lights and the position, the scale, the intensity, the color, all these different properties that uh, are required to match the foreground and the background. If we could create the same LED panel on a, scale, on a cheap kind of scale budget, well then that was dynamic based on the environment we're good to go. So my objective was to create an array of averaged lights or color swatches of uh, what we would see in the camera. So you can imagine even in this shot here, the top left would be whatever average color that is. And then the next one, then the next one. So this would be a darker color. That would be a darker color, etc., etc. Didn't know how to do that. Um, until I watched one Lux machinima, machinima, video which uh, talks through their virtual production setup. So the video is showing now and I freeze framed on one frame and I saw an image that looked exactly like what I was trying to achieve. They didn't talk about the technique they use, they didn't talk about the tools that they used, but from that image I did a reverse search and I found out that they were using the DMX library to create light patches from cameras and output out that out to lights. And at that point in time, I knew nothing about the DMX library, what it was, how it worked, um, anything, right? So after a bit of research, I figured out that the DMX library was a sampler. So you could use that as a sampler to gather the light information, apple that to a DMX fixture and control lights, right? Never knew anything about it. Sounded perfect for the job. And so the early test that I went from that is, can I control a strip of LED light based on a DMX patch output out. So it's the exact same thing as using a standard light, but it's using the DMX system. And the video you can see right now is me showing that the top left uh, DMX patch is outputting the color, just that one cube, that one, one square, outputting the color to the LED lights, which work pretty good. So let's have a look at how the LED code in the Arduino um, IDE works. So obviously we're, we're coding an ESP32, but we can still use the Arduino IDE to program it. So we're using this um, library called Fast LED, and it's one of the, the more commonly used uh, libraries for controlling addressable LEDs. And uh, it's pretty straightforward. However, I've got a lot of custom code in here. So um, we are using uh, pin two to send out the information, but we've also got um, the number of LEDs. So at the moment we've specified 300, but that can be the full range of how big the panel is. So if you've got a panel that's only got 100 LEDs in there, we can specify that and um, we should be good. Um, so essentially what we're doing is, uh, there's a few things in here. This becomes useful for some code later, which is essentially going to uh, split up a string into different sections 
and assign them to variables, right? So uh, let's keep going through this really quickly. We've got the CRGB uh, number of LEDs, which sets up the uh, fast LED library. Um, this is just a bit of a test that can be deleted, but we start the serial um, at 5, 500,000 baud rate. A uh, bit of a timeout just to make sure that we've got enough, um, if, it, if it's delaying too much, it'll kind of kill the command. Uh, the fast LED setup is the type of LED strip. Uh, the pin that is getting the, the information to dictate what uh, LEDs to light up. The GRB is the sequence of the lights. The very first one must be G green, red, and then blue in the sequence. Um, otherwise, if these aren't bright, well, then, you know, we need to remap them. Um, and essentially, it's just saying we've got this uh, number of LED or this LED, LED pin with the number of LEDs, and it's just setting it all up. Uh, in here we specify the max power in volts so this is a 5 volt LED strip and also it's the maximum number of uh, milliamps that need to be in injected into it um, this might increase or decrease depending on how many LED lights you have in there um, at that point I did the math on it so at 50 milliamps times the amount of LEDs that I had it made sense to be around 13.5 amps inside of this right we can clamp this down to ensure a bit more safety and we can boost it up to brighten up the lights but we risk blowing some of the lights if it's too high uh, we clear it and we show it so it shows you basic command to turn on the lights we clear to turn them off and set brightness can be controlled via um, obviously uh, we can control the, the brightness value inside of Unreal Engine if we want Oh, but at the moment we've just default set it to the maximum brightness. Uh, so how it works essentially is if the serial is available, so the um, the controller is connected and uh, we're getting some values from the serial port, um, or if it's not available it will just jump out of it. If it's available it'll read the Arduino value string from the output from UE4 and um, then it will uh, essentially just assign a few based positions so we got the R LED position of 0, 1 and then 2 because that's specified up the top here um, the sequence is a little bit off but what it does and this is the code for everything basically it'll cycle through the um, for the number of times the number of LED commands that are coming through in the string um, and it will split them up so what's being output from ue4 is a essentially like a a, a csv so a comma separated value uh, the first value is always going to be the red the second one is always going to be the green and the third one is always going to be the blue and as such what it'll do is it'll take those values find the comma and split it and assign it to the r um, g and b so string value one is the red blue and green we get the value of the arduino value a red position, green position, and blue position, so 0, 1, and 2. And then we essentially change the string values to an int, and then we update the lights. So uh, we say the LED, so the first 9, because it's a 3x3 three three grid um, on the light panel, so on this thing here, because it's a 3x3, three three, it's going to cycle um, between uh, the 9 and update one grid spot only with the RGB value that it's extracted. Uh, and then from that it's going to add on 9 so it's going to go to the next set of 9 values in the CSV and then cycle through the loop again right until it reaches the end um, in theory if uh, we've only output a string of 9 RGB values um, or, or maybe one RGB value it will update 9 LEDs um, or uh, you know 6 or, or two RGB values, it'll be 18 LEDs, etc., etc. All right, and then after that, it'll turn it on. All right. So in, in essence, what this will do is it'll read the um, CSV. It'll grab RGB position. It will split it. It'll then jump to the next section, or it'll update the lights and then jump to the next section and do it again. So every single loop of this loads in the command to say this nine set of LEDs will have this value. This next nine set of LEDs will have this value, right? Um, that runs through this, which essentially just takes the string in, sep takes the separator, which is the comma, and then finds the index, and then splits it out. It's, um, that's pretty much it. So this whole bit of code can control 
any array of LEDs. If they are in a nine by or three by three block, we can change some of the values if that's what we want to do. Um, but it's pretty straightforward, and that's how the code works. The most changes that we have to this project come in form of the DMX library. So we used an existing DMX framework to get an idea of exactly how it works. Essentially, these are all pre-existing framework things where we set up the DMX subsystems and we receive and send. We I don't really know too much about this, so it's all pretty new to me. But the ones that we do have is we've got this DMX controller, which is a little bit unorganized at the moment, and I need to go through and organize it. And uh, it's got some legacy stuff, I think, somewhere in here or maybe in, in another kind of section. But the way that this works is obviously on begin play of the scene, it will open the port. And because we're using two different ESPs, we need two different ports and two different uh, buyout rates as well. So that just runs through the standard process of obviously if it's connected, it's connected. If it's not connected, it's, it's going to tell us. And then from that, we create a timer by event. So I didn't want this to run on tick because the amount of strings that I had to generate from reading the DMX values would bog down the system. I just put a really quick timer on there so it'll just kind of tick away at its own rate. Um, from that, we've just gone and we've done our custom event, which comes up and gets the DMX library using the DMX subsystem. It'll go through a loop based on how many components of the DMX library are in there. So if we have a real quick look at this, it'll go through each of these, which you'll find is a one-to-one -one map to the LED panel. And it will essentially go through, get read, read the value, append it to a string down here. So it goes through getting the values of red, green, and blue pens them to red comma green comma blue comma um, and then sets it to LED values and then loops through however many times so it's constantly appending a string to a CSV essentially the first one comes up obviously if it doesn't have any strings in there it reads it checks it and then it start it doesn't start off with a comma or doesn't end off with a comma as well All right so red green blue and then it'll take that current value and then comma red comma, green, comma, blue, and then do the same thing, current value, red, green, green, blue. Once it reached the max of the loop, it completes, it reads the string, it prints it out to the serial port, and then it clears it off for the next line, All right? So in essence, what it's doing is it's going to this DMX pixel mapping manager, reading every single value, putting it into a CSV, and then printing it out to the uh, serial port. That's roughly how that works. Um, in terms of the DMX library, this is set up to be a patch system, and this is where maybe further experimentation with DMX and Arduino controls for DMX will be uh, faster and more responsive. We have each patch, which corresponds to each cube, which has, uh, in this case, four channels. So red, green, blue, and intensity. So they can be all mapped to that as well. Um, and that's about it in terms of the DMX library. We set this up. This pixel mapping, this DMX pixel mapping, takes a the texture render target 2D, which is attached to the camera facing the opposite direction, and it'll assign that as well. Lastly, the scene has been set up to be a little bit more accurate to real world lighting. So if we go into um, you know standard lighting in here it's really super intense we've got a few things in here um one one light and we've got cameras as well which look like this um and a few other things in the scene right so we've got another lens uh, light here that is uh, set up now these lights are interesting so we, in here we've got our light tools i was going to start creating a whole bunch of tool sets for the lights with their own construction scripts in here you can see inside of um, this construction script, we are, where are we doing? We're just setting width and the height and elevating that to a variable, doing some really dodgy math. I'm sure there's a better way to do this. I was trying to make this look exactly the same um, of the light resolution to map a polygon with a emissive value to the exact same space. This has been fixed in newer versions of Unreal where you do have a visible light 
checkbox so you can see the visible panel which is mapped as well but i made my own hacky version of this so we take a width and height of a polygon plane which has got a missing material which is also synced up to the intensity value of the light so we get the set light color based on the variables we've got the new intensity and then we set a material, dynamic material instance select the vector parameter and then we punch that into luminance as well so the benefit of that is we can use these lights so maybe i'll use this one over here and we have a width and height value and an intensity and a color as well so we can specify width height intensity obviously and then we can change the color of the light as well all right so in this it was all about just trying to create a few different tools that help us control what's going on in here and then obviously these can be synced up to output to something like uh, uh, Arduino or ESP32 as well. So uh, that's roughly how we've uh, changed the scene. We've tried to set the scene up so we had physical lights in terms of the exposure values using manual methods. Uh, we look at the camera, we're trying to set up the camera to be, uh, or the cameras inside of here, to be exactly the same as the settings in the, the physical camera looking at obviously focus distance and uh, sensor for size which is a 16 by 9 because we've been putting that as well as 16 by 9 and other properties in there as well so the essence of this is to uh, we've done a, few, a lot of things in here which is unseen quite often we've created uh, individual blueprints that we can use as controllers we've got more tools in there uh, we've got virtual cameras, we've got light tools, we've also got a DMX patches, which can all be ported over to another project pretty easily. So um, a lot of stuff going in there. Um, hopefully that makes a bit of sense, but um, that's how it all works. Given that I've proved that we can output DMX patches to LED strips, um, well, the whole point now is to say, okay, can we create a light panel? Can we create an array of LEDs that has enough light to emit onto the, the foreground actor that's strong enough because if we just had a small LED strip, probably wouldn't be strong enough. However, if we had a big panel, we could probably emit enough light to illuminate a source from a distance. That's where this thing came in place. So ignore the back, that's the front, that's it there. We created an array of LEDs of three by three for each square. So you can see here, that's one square, that's one square, and the next, follow on, follow on. So we've got six by five. And each of those is uh, custom uh, soldered. We grab that light strip, we've cut them up, we've soldered them all together, and we've created a network. And um, we've tested that. So to test this out, to make sure that the DMX patches were working perfectly fine, I created uh, three strips of colors, red, green, and blue in Unreal Engine, and animated the camera pointing at it and panning left and right. Outputted those to a DMX patch, straight to the LED panel, and it worked pretty good, right? So the proof of concept was there. We had a light panel, we had color being grabbed from the DMX library, and we were outputting it effectively to the light source. So when I took that, and I started thinking, okay, well, we can use a capture 2D scene node in Unreal, and then we can grab the, the reverse of the camera. So if the camera's looking directly at us, we can grab the reverse of the camera and then use that to illuminate the foreground. Um, I started coming into some, some issues, right? One of the issues was when we had light, uh, quite an even light source, maybe it was all white, this would start off, maybe I'll move it over here, would start off really bright and then it would start going yellow. And I couldn't understand why and I thought, hmm, maybe the lights aren't strong enough. It just wasn't bright, it was quite dim, it wasn't illuminating enough of the light, it wasn't from a distance. So at that point, the decision was made to go and try and grab some stronger LEDs that could illuminate more. Um, interestingly, we haven't ended up using these, right? But the problem wasn't so much about the LED types and the intensity of that. It turns out it was to do with the amperage going through the lights. So as there are a lot of 
cables to go from the very start light to the very end one, it was losing amperage over time. Therefore, the lights weren't bright. Therefore, it couldn't, channel, it couldn't power red, green, and blue lights in each LED. Um, there were problems with that. So after learning this, I learned that we needed some stronger batteries. So we grabbed one of these, which is a 6.6 volt, um, 2200 milliamp hours. And it discharged at 25, uh, essentially amp max, right? The math on this meant that each LED needed around 50 milliamps and overall the rough average was 13.5 amps that needed to come through here. I also found out that we needed to inject at these points, probably every strip. We see it here, there's one there, one there, one, one there, one there, one there. Um, little injection points of additional amperage to ensure that every LED was evenly lit. Controlled by a microcontroller which went through a couple of iterations as well. The very, very, very early one was disgusting. The soldering on this is really bad. Um, and also these cables here that connected with the main control board, which has been cut up, as you can see here, were too thin. The amperage inside of that essentially melted the cables, which was a big problem. So um, from that, once again, more engineering in this, We've cleaned up the circuit board, much neater. We've used a different jack right there, which connects directly to the large jack on the battery, and we're all good to go. Run by the ESP as well. So one of the challenges that we faced at this point was also, can we have the LED panel running simultaneously with the controller off the same platform? And interestingly, it did kind of work, but you'll see in some of these videos that are coming up now, there was lots of um, strobing, right? So what would happen is it would get it would output the controllers from the the controller to um, Unreal, and then Unreal would send the string of commands back to the microcontroller to output to the lights. However, Given, even though we've got a really fast microcontroller, given the latency of encoding and decoding the, the strings and sending between, it would never get to the very end LED on this board, right? It would maybe kind of, kind of make it halfway through, or it wouldn't illuminate them all, or it would illuminate them all, but it wouldn't hold them on. And as a result, um, the board just wasn't stable. So the higher the um, frequency or the... the refresh rate, the less stable the lights were, the lower refresh rate, the less responsive the controller was. So there was a bit of a problem trying to balance the two together and there were some weird outcomes that came from that. At one point I honestly thought that I couldn't, I couldn't run the system together and I was a bit worried. However, one of the things I wanted to try and solve was could you theoretically run two of these chips at the same time into Unreal or out of Unreal, all right? So tests on that proved that you could. Alrighty, this is using two Arduinos, uh, one for that and then one for this. And um, let's see what happens. Let's start with the MX and press play. So we can still move around. Zoomed a little choppy. That's fine. Just dependent on that. Essentially, we would have one that ran uh, the lights and one that ran the microcontroller or the controllers um, for the camera which was actually better. So the one that is hooked up to the lights runs at 500,000 baud rate. The one that runs the camera is 115200, so 115,200 baud rate. And that worked out perfectly because the SDK 
for the uh, Blackmagic camera control had to run at 115200. Couldn't run at 500,000. Whereas the lights ran better when they were faster, they were more responsive, uh, they all illuminated, it was efficient. And the benefits of that is that we could split the code. We could have purely light controls on one and purely camera controls on the other. So as a result, we managed to hook up the LED panels with the camera control and have them working all simultaneously, um, synced up. And the cool thing about that is we could do extra things with it. We uh, hooked up, we can see a little bit of a hole in the bottom of this, but we decided to hook up a HTC Vive controller to that and see if we could control the virtual lights inside of Unreal, which is also replicated on the physical lights, and that can be done as well. So we can uh, create a few different things going on with this project, which is light control, camera controls, we could have multiple panels that act as normal studio lights that we can position in the 3D space that creates lights inside of the game engine and positions them accordingly. You can use the game engine to control the intensity, the color, um, you know, the, the type of lights uh, that's going on, which will be replicated in the real world. Um, but also we could use a, a smaller array on the rig itself. Um, to have the camera there with the tracker, a couple of lights on the side to do front facing illumination. So there's a lot of things that we can do with this. And uh, the good thing about this is it all works and you can see that in action here. We did a few user tests or sorry, I should say, we did a few tests to look at color, look at lights, look at uh, reflections. And uh, the whole point of this was to see if we can synchronize color inside of the game engine with the real footage as well. So what you're seeing now is we're trying to test out red, green, and blue, and white light. Um, also the reflection values on that. And the synchronization of the camera with the controller um, and other settings as well. All right, so good, thing, good news is for the most part, it works. Uh, there are some further adjustments needed to be made inside of Unreal to really hone in the accuracy of the color. Um, the videos that you're seeing right now, the, um, the original video that's coming from the Blackmagic camera has been uh, gammed up, so a little bit brighter. Uh, as a result, obviously, it doesn't match perfectly. However, if we adjust the exposure values inside of Unreal Engine, uh, we play around with the, uh, the ISO a little bit, we could probably theoretically match it all perfectly which is awesome right so at this point we've established that the lights will work with the camera with the trackers synchronized um, on a small scale project which works really cool from there obviously we're going to talk about some of the limitations that we've got so far and some further things that need to be investigated so we'll do that in a sec so talking about a few of the limitations and issues I had on the test days, um, we've got a few issues that popped up. Number one, some of them are silly, some of them are a, bit, a little bit more complicated, but one of the very uh, number one issues that I had was the cable length. Given the length of the cables of the USB that I had access to, which were pretty long, they were probably like two or three meters long, we needed longer cables. So the problem was if we wanted to walk around this physical space with the camera, and the lights and all that and we wanted to move these in in space we wanted to have a longer cable and unfortunately we didn't have that so therefore the testing was a little bit limited by the cable length that's an easy one to solve obviously we can just go out and get some longer cables we can hook that up and we can make sure that that works perfectly fine one of the more serious issues that we had was um, the size of the camera to be honest so the black magic cameras even though they're called a pocket cinema camera the original ones were quite small, but the larger ones, such as the 6K camera that I ended up using, um, putting it on this takes up a massive amount of space. And um, I just, at the, that point in time, did not have the confidence to effectively hold this up with the camera weight in there, with the tracker on top, and trust that uh, I could hold this and it wouldn't fall off, right? Um, the last thing I want to do is, is drop a really, really, really expensive camera and break it. So therefore, one thing that we do need to do is we need to re-engineer 
some of this to make sure that it's it's more secure maybe put a brace through here um, make it a little bit more sturdy for the use of a camera um, adding to that having a shoulder mount would be very beneficial as well uh, if we've got a shoulder mount we can mount it nicely we can have complete control over the weight of it and there wouldn't be any anxiety to do with potentially dropping and damaging the camera um, one of the other problems as, as well is this form factor well it's great for testing it's not amazing for user testing um, the big pa panel array would work really good for a freestanding light however if you wanted to attach that to the controller with the camera you can see that this thing is quite large okay which means that um, ideally if I was going to work with the um, the concept of lighting up the foreground elements I would like to have two individual lights potentially or even more to maybe mount here and maybe one on this side as well right so the little lights that come off more panels less scale right because this proof of concept at least showed that we can have an array of six by five lights that are controlled by the microcontroller efficiently and, and fast uh, we can essentially do that cut it up into a few different pieces spread it up into a more um, easy to use form factor and use that effectively right so um, from that there's also some work to do with the light and the the properties on Unreal Engine and the camera um, given the intensity of the light this it's not clear to know how much lux is coming out of this um, or the exposure or the the intensity of the light therefore it's a little bit harder to uh, create that inside of uh, Unreal, right? Uh, that needs to be investigated. A little bit more work to be done on that, right? So we moving forward with all this. Let's wrap this up a bit. The proof of concept works. The lights synchronize with Unreal Engine. We can use them in a variety of different ways using two D scene captures, um, or we can use them by extracting information from actual lights. We can track those lights using HDC Vive controllers, um, and we can also run the DMX platform one of the problems that we've got in terms of the DMX side of things that needs to be resolved a little bit more is it's a brute force way of dealing with DMX so right now I've got it outputting red green blue value into a string and then splitting the string inside of uh, the Arduino or the, the microcontroller I should say and then that's driving the LEDs the problem with that is the more lights that you input the slower the command because naturally uh, these microcontrollers they'll handle strings but they're not the best way to do it so there's a couple of different options one we investigate using uh, bytes as a replacement or number two we actually start looking at different microcontrollers that control DMX and I found some that work well with the ESP32 that's the next stage I'm going to experiment with that make sure that we can get microcontrollers working on the DMX uh, language essentially and working efficiently I think that will optimize the lights a little bit more and it will probably allow us to add more lights to the, the concept further development on the controller needs to be done we need to bolster this some of the 3d prints they're not completely tight and stable this works really well this flops around a little bit uh, drilling holes and having stable screw holes is one of the weak points of the resin printers um, so we need to investigate that. We need to redesign some of those. We need to optimize the code for Unreal Engine. Um, some of it is a little bit jittery. So we need to clamp that down. We've done some clamping in the previous version, uh, but not too much, right? Uh, and also it'd be good to see if we can establish a, a little bit of an ease of use of the platform. So can we turn this project into a plugin? Can we have pre-existing lights that will hook up to DMX lights? Can we have presets for cameras? Can we have presets for lenses? Um, that makes the whole project work more efficiently and easier. That would be something that would be worth exploring because ideally what I want to do moving forward is to do some user tests, put some Unreal experts into the program, into the setup and see if they can do the, the physical side of things. Put some cinematographers inside of this to see if they can easily control Unreal. Um, a lot of this will be re require the missing hardware, so making sure that we can get our time code and Genlock sync working with it all. 
that's the last stage and then making sure that it's easy enough to use and we can test it on the higher end computer because right now we've been hardware restricted by um you know the computers that are in our labs right we'd like to test that out and see what we can do so moving forward there's a lot of things that i would like to do to improve this project however we're nearly there the proof of concept works the lights work the cameras work next we should have action so hopefully next video that i do will showcase it all working in a professional environment amazingly so we'll leave it there uh, thanks so much for watching the length of this very long documentary basically uh, hopefully that gives you an insight into what i've gone through with this project it's been a long one it's been an interesting one it's been a frustrating one but i'm happy to be here and i'm looking forward to seeing what we can do next in the next project thanks and i'll see you later